Yes, that is a shocking statistic. But even more shocking is that 400 people die needlessly from drowning in the UK. This is something that can be changed. In this short documentary, I will be speaking to two people from different organisations that deal directly with this issue. I will also speak to you, the public, to see how well you know about this issue. Over the last year, three deaths have occurred at the Brighton Beach. I have decided to speak to the Brighton Seafront officer and I started by asking him if there's anything challenging about his job. Every day can be challenging, uh, depending on incidents that happen um, in the summer. Obviously every day is very busy with lots of people coming down to the city to enjoy the beaches and the facilities, um, water rescues, antisocial behaviour. Um, there can be ch challenging situations and decisions to be made um, as part of the team here to make sure everybody is safe. Uh, the winter, again, different challenges, big stormy conditions. Um, you're having to make decisions, out, are you going to enter the water? Um, it's difficult enough um, for us to manage ourselves in the water at present um, in big waves and strong currents, but uh, to get somebody else out is, is very difficult. I briefly asked him who deals with the bodies that have drowned. Most victims drown due to panic and shock. If we're here um, and during the daytime and we're here and we're, we're first responders to it, then we will get there and have the body to deal with. Um, depending on the conditions, um, whether it's safe to go in and retrieve the body or whether we need to wait for it to wash up somewhere and we just we monitor it as it goes along the shoreline. Uh, but there's been circumstances where I've helped um, pull out bodies out of the water. There's a couple of ways you can drown. Um, you're, a lot of people, when they become unconscious in the water, they'll be fighting it um, and they'll go under. Um, they will become unconscious as, as the oxygen starved out of their body. Um, they will become unconscious uh, and then the stomach and the lungs will fill with water. Not a huge amount, the lungs, it doesn't need much. Um, but it's basically asphyxiation through lack of oxygen getting to the, the main brain and the heart um, and that will kill you because you're not getting the blood to the vital areas to keep your body functioning. Um, there's also a stage where some people, you get a little uh, you, epiglottis, uh, will spasm out um, and it will lock itself out. Um, and that will prevent air getting down into the lungs as well. So that will, again, asphyxiate you and kill you in that, in that way. Um, we're constantly trying to improve um, safety. Um, there's a lot of public sea safety information that's gone out. Um, it's, it's there all year round, but come the winter time, we put additional signage out there to warn people of the dangers, especially during the winter period. Uh, this year we launched three sea safety videos with a local media company uh, which are on the council website which again educate families, teenagers and people that um, come to the beach to enjoy the, the drink and the bars. I moved 154 miles up north to Warwickshire to meet up with a charity called Royal Life Saving Society UK. They showed me some families that have lost loved ones due to drowning. Megan was um she was a beautiful girl. She was 20 when she died. And we didn't know what had happened to start with because we just knew she was, she was missing. Um, she was actually missing for nearly six weeks. And I didn't ever get a chance to say goodbye. She just went. So it's something that I've got to carry for the rest of my life. The fact that I've, I've lost my daughter and I'm never going to stop missing her. My lasting memory of her is of her growing up and being very much my friend as well as my daughter. And that's, um, that's something I miss an awful lot. My first thought that someone had taken him, not, not for a minute that he would be in the pool. Jack had obviously gone out of the doors um, and fell in. We expected if he'd gone into the water, he'd be on the water. Floating. Jack was at the bottom. And you don't look at the bottom of the pool, you just look at the top. And he gave so much and made so many people love him instantly. The initial impact was just one of shock and horror. When I discovered that it was drowning that had been the cause of death, it was really bizarre because David was petrified of drowning. I just don't like to think about the fact that that's what happened to him because I just can't imagine what must have been going through his mind. He must have known that we were going to die. I can still recall it like it was yesterday. My mum and dad just being in absolute pieces. Sometimes I can hear a song on the radio and just cry because it just touches upon it. I absolutely just do not want people to have to go through what me and my family have been through. 
It just has a huge impact on every aspect of your life. He'd want to be remembered for being David Cullen. It just makes me smile when I think about him. I decided to speak with Michael Dunn, the acting director of Volunteers and Community Education. I began by asking what the charity is about. Yeah, the Royal Life Saving Society UK is the drowning prevention charity for the UK and we were established back in 1891 and since then we've been working to provide that education and training to really everybody in the country so that people are equipped to look after themselves and each other and with the ultimate aim of, of reducing accidental drownings in the UK to as low as they can possibly be, ideally zero. I moved on to ask him about statistics regarding the charity's good work. I think the, the best statistic we've got is um, drownings this year were, were closer to 300 than they've ever been before and they're steadily decreasing so that's, that's the, the statistic that everyone's most interested in, the one we're, we're working really hard on with other organisations that also work in drowning prevention. Um, some of the, the campaigns we've started recently that have contributed to that recent reduction we believe is uh, focus campaigns on, we have Drowning Prevention Week every year, which is an annual campaign where we ask schools, leisure centres, clubs, youth groups, everybody really, and the media to, to get involved with the, the key messages around drowning prevention and how to stay safe and invite people to take part in activities so they can learn a little bit more about what to do if something does go wrong and how to help each other. That campaign, the Twitter reach for that campaign this year reached over 100,000 people just in Drowning Prevention Week alone. It's reached more since then, so that's a really successful campaign for us in getting that message to a, a really broad number of people. We use the whole spectrum of social media and that's a great way to reach an awful lot of people uh, very quickly. Ideally, we would then have those people coming in and receiving a bit more education from us face-to-face. Uh, -face. So we support schools in delivering that, that education on our behalf. And we also have a wide network of, uh, of volunteer-run life-saving clubs and indeed leisure centres that affiliate to us. And they deliver awards and training through, through their, their clubs and, and centres as well. And that's a really, that's sort of the gold standard, if you like, because people aren't just learning a few messages about water safety, they learn uh, almost everything there is to know about what the hazards are, how you identify them, how you manage them, what to do if something goes wrong, how to do CPR, the full spectrum. We work with a, a wide number of charities and organisations uh, working together to deliver that, that safety message to as many people as possible. Some I could name is the, uh, the RNLI, uh, the Coast Guard, MCA, ROSPA, the Royal Society for Prevention of Accidents, and a lot of those organisations work together as part of the National Water Safety Forum, which is a group that, that meet and, and make sure that the strategy that we're, we're reaching everybody who needs to be reached to, to keep as many people as safe as possible. And this year we've just launched the National Strategy for Drone Prevention in the UK, which all of those organisations and more will be following to make sure that we're delivering the best sort of information and education and rescue services to save as many lives as we can. Drowning Prevention Week is our big national campaign. It takes place every June and we encourage as many people as possible to as many providers as possible to provide some sort of uh, educational opportunity for people, whether that's a leisure centre providing free sessions for people to drop in at and, and try some of the life-saving skills, or a life-saving club, or indeed a lot of schools take part as well and we provide free resources for schools so they can spend as much time as possible teaching their pupils how to stay safe around water and what the dangers are. We also have uh, an event that people can take part in called Toathon. So if anyone wants to uh, take part in that, look on the website for 2016. And that is like a, a swimathon event where you swim as many lengths as you can, but you use a life-saving skill. You tow your partner for as, as long as you can and see how far you can get and hopefully collect some sponsorship along the way. And that will help us to fund our educational programs, particularly our programs with schools over the next year. Well, the Royal Life Saving Society UK is entirely self-funded, so sadly we don't get any money from the government, um, and we, we fund ourselves through the sale of some, some qualifications that we provide 
such as the pool lifeguard qualification. Um, that helps us to provide that drowning prevention education and training, but also the, the money that comes into the charity from that training is then spent on running our charitable programs. And we also collect uh, uh, grants and, and fundraising to, to boost that, that income so that we can provide as much education as possible. One of the reasons that we believe a lot of the drownings that happen in the UK happen at open water sites is because in the UK, even in summer, when the air temperature gets quite warm, the water temperature tends to stay quite, quite cool. Uh, so most people then base their swimming ability on what they've been able to do in the swimming pool, which is normally kept at around 30 degrees. But a lake or, or, the, or the beach in the summer months might stay as cool as 15 degrees, maybe 12 some areas of water if, if the, the supply of water into a lake for example is from a mountain will be colder still. Having heard from Brighton Council and the Royal Life Saving Society UK I wanted to see what the public thought. I asked Duran if they would swim in the sea and if so why? Um, I would not be comfortable swimming in the sea because I feel like humans were not built for water and I feel like it is a high risk for us and we're more likely to die. Um, so I feel like the sea is for mammals because it's their natural habitat. So um, no, the sea, I was not somewhere I'd, I would go for swimming. Swimming in the sea, no, because it's dirty and I don't think it's very hygienic. Um, definitely, I'm from Devon so I grew up around the coast and I'm really used to it. I spend Christmas Day, it's a bit of a tradition, running down to the sea, going in for a dip, coming back out and same New Year's Day, go for a tombstoning, so that's running along the harbour and jumping into the sea from there. Yeah, um, only in the summer though. Like, I'm from Hastings, so I'm local. Um, it's alright, I don't mind it. Having listened to all sides, I have come to a conclusion that all of us can help change some of these shocking statistics. We can all do this by raising the issue of drowning with our families and friends.